Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds, we are back again. This is going to be a fun one. We've got a little panel here, and John Liebler, one of our Insider members, volunteers at a place called Orca, a.k.a. Team Orca, who's doing some really, really, really cool stuff in the Indian River Lagoon. There, I started watching some of the videos on Facebook, and I'm looking at this pollution mapping right, where you actually just envision seeing a map of Indian River Lagoon and and you see it based on colors about how bad the pollution is and really using science and technology, not just finger pointing and uh, and coming up with some pretty uh, awesome and exciting solutions. So we've got Bridget and Dr. Edie herself and, of course, Justin, who is our resident nerd fisherman slash marine, wants to be, want to be a marine biologist. And uh, ladies, first and foremost, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Excited to be here. I'm pumped. So Orca, where did you come up with the name? What does it mean? What's the purpose? So Orca is the Ocean Research and Conservation Association. Um, I helped found it in 2005. I spent my career as a deep sea biologist studying bioluminescence, um, hunting down giant squid, doing all kinds of cool things. And uh, uh, there were a couple reports that came out about the deteriorating state of the ocean about the same time that Harbor Branch Oceanographic was shutting down their submersible program. So I was looking to move on, but I felt like I really wanted to start giving back to the ocean. And estuaries are a tiny, tiny percentage of the surface area of the ocean, but they are such a huge portion of the health of the ocean because they're a nursery for so many open ocean animals. And to see what was once the um, most biologically diverse estuary in the United States, or so it claimed anyway, um, collapsing right before my very eyes, I, I felt like this was where I wanted to concentrate my efforts. So we originally started out developing water quality monitors called Kilroy's, um, and then we've greatly expanded our efforts uh, at other ways of trying to track where the pollution is coming from, and our, our focus is on using facts to drive change. I love it, and you're She's very humble, but quite the celebrity. I mean, TED Talk and all kinds of uh, cool stuff. I read the whole bio and started going down this rabbit trail of all the stuff you've done. I was like, holy smokes. Um, so, so, so cool. So you could have picked anywhere and you said Indian River Lagoon, like that, like that is the main focus right now, to be clear? Or, or do you yeah, guys, it okay. is. When, when we started Orca, we actually incorporated in New York um, and we were looking at estuaries in general. But as we saw things getting worse and worse here, we decided just to focus our efforts in our own backyard. Got it. And so what are you guys looking for? I, I, I tease this whole pollution mapping. What, what, is the, what is the goal? When you guys are going to raise money and getting grants and all this stuff, what, what are you looking for? So our tagline is mapping pollution, finding solutions. And you know, you've got to figure out where the pollution is coming from. Uh, the worse it gets, the more you see people coming out with downstream solutions, which are no solution at all. We have to figure out where the pollution is coming from and get it stopped at its source. And, and we, we really, really try to avoid finger pointing because it's counterproductive and we've got to understand that we're all polluters. We just have to figure out how to live together in this ecosystem to everybody's benefit. I love it. Gosh, wow. It sounds so simple, Justin, not pointing fingers and actually coming up with science-based solutions. Well, no, I mean, just getting to the root of things is is the logic here. Mm -hmm. You know, you're right. It's I, I've made the same before that critics are going to be critics, but sometimes they're oftentimes they fail at providing a solution to whatever they're criticizing that actually addresses the core of the problem instead of a short term solution to a long term problem. So uh, so I'm, I'm fascinated that that's that's the core focus about how you go about finding out, you know, these pollution maps and sourcing exactly where this is stemming from to figure out what is exactly causing that and how do we mitigate it? Exactly. I saw the one, um, it, it was brief. I, I, I was like dying to see more. And I think if you guys can focus on that and, and, and show that to the public, it's so powerful, but I, you kind of zoomed in on this one area on the map. And so once again, imagine, a map of a, of a pretty big area of Indian River, Lagoon, Indian River Lagoon, and you see different colors, just like you would on any kind of radar or anything like that. And, and um, 
it's like really red in this one area. It was like a canal. And you get, I mean, I assume it was from people fertilizing and putting a lot of pollutants in the water in this one canal. And it was like hot red, like compared to everything else. And it was like, I mean, tough to kind of ignore that when, uh, but I, 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 the question is, how, how do you get that? Like how, how, how did you know that was the red hot area or areas? What are you guys doing to get these samples and how often do you sample, et cetera? So for, for the kind of map you're talking about, where it's kind of, it looks like a weather map where red is hot and blue is cold, only red is the pollution and blue is clean. And um, we go out and we take sediment samples and we do it, we do a lot of sampling um, at different locations. And then we create these gradient maps based on what we measure in the sediment, total nitrogen, total phosphorus. Um, we look at sulfur, we look at heavy metals, we look at, we've got a whole lot of different layers to these maps. The one I think you're talking about was nitrogen. And that's what we've seen in a lot of places where, where there's just a bright red in these canal systems. And then just across the way, you can have um, mangrove shoreline and it's blue, it's completely clean. That particular one is a community that's so like a lot of the landscaping that's done all up and down the Indian River Lagoon where everybody gets a deep water dock. So they have a bulkhead and these sloping grass lawns right down to the edge of that bulkhead. So all of the grass clippings and all of the fertilizer comes off. What's interesting about that particular one is it's not on septic. So it's, you know, it, it looks like most of it has to be coming from the grass clippings or it could be coming from reuse water, but we, we tested mm -hmm. in a bunch of places and found that the reuse water isn't the source of, of the nitrogen. Um, so one of the things that we've been campaigning for recently is how much we could clean up the Indi Indian River Lagoon with just one simple trick, which would be to read landscape along the shoreline, wherever possible, put in living shorelines like mangroves. But if you can't do that, if you put in a buffered shoreline, we just did a demonstration uh, project down in Stewart with the city of Stewart in Shepherd Park, where we re-landscaped that park with swales and deep rooted native plants and the amount of phosphate coming up was reduced just astonishingly. I mean, I need, I want another year of data to really believe it's true, but um, if it's as good as it seems on the first blush, we just need to be doing this everywhere. And it's not a big deal to do. A lot of places up North around Chesapeake Bay, for example, they've been mandating buffered shorelines for the um, agriculture as well as for uh, homeowners for a long time makes a huge difference and it's something we could do right away. And we actually have one of our pollution mapping um, pictures shows just how much of a difference these planted shorelines can make. There's an image of a residential area like you mentioned that's full of canals that shows bright bright red and right north of it is a golf course and this golf course is part of I believe it's the Autobahn Society where they have this buffered shoreline lining it and it's blue. And we didn't expect that from a golf course where they're regularly fertilizing to oh, get yeah. that green grass. So it was a huge find and really exciting to be able to share just the impact of these shorelines. And, and this could be as simple in terms of uh, tr trying to envision this while you're listening. Uh, instead of just having grass that goes all the way to the shoreline or a seawall, imagine like the last three feet are like shells with some some plants right i mean is that that's what so that my husband and i did that on our property um we had a grass lawn right down to the edge of the seawall um and we just changed it to a swale with native plants so we have uh sunshine mimosa um perennial peanut and muley grass it looks beautiful. Yeah, I'm sure it looks beautiful. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it absorbs all of the, the runoff. Um, we, we went, we took it even one step further. We put in a French drain underneath. We collect every bit of water that comes off our property property and put it in a tank for irrigation. Um, but that's extreme just to put in a swale and, and deep rooted plants along the edge of the seawall would make a huge difference. They did that in the moorings in Vero beach. Um, and it looks really lovely and it, it really does help a lot because it keeps the grass clippings from going into the water. It absorbs the nutrients before they swoosh off into the water. It's something we can all be doing and, and it, it can even be done inland. People have, sometimes they call them lagoon gardens where you, you, you know, just a rain garden that collects the water 
because what you want to do is slow the water down. Anything we can do to slow the flow. Everything that was done to Florida in the early days of settlement was about getting the water off the land as quickly as possible to make it useful for agriculture and for housing. Yeah. And, and that's undone all of nature's good filtration process. So what we want to do is just slow the flow every possible way we can so the water can percolate slowly back down into the aquifer, recharge the aquifer, and get cleaned up along the way. I, I saw one thing. Uh, what did you call it? Black mayonnaise. Mayonnaise, mayonnaise, depending on where you're from. But uh, the muck, right? And, and yeah. you know, Justin, you fished in the lagoon for m m multiple decades. My brother used to live there in Indian Atlantic and Melbourne for a while. And, you know, we grew up fishing there and, you know, now we go back and it's night and day. I mean, seagrass is dead in places that it used to be super healthy. And, and, and there was a lot of just beautiful white sand. You could see the bottom and now you see muck, not everywhere, but in a lot of places. And you talked about the grass clippings again there. It's come up multiple times. Uh, talk, talk about this muck because we've all seen it. We all think it's, I've heard a lot of different uh, hypothesis on but what tell us about this muck that seems to be taking over a lot of the areas there in the lagoon so there's places that it's as much as eight to ten feet deep what it's, it, it yeah um and it's just smothering the life on the bottom of the lagoon it really does feel like black mayonnaise only it smells sulfurous it's nasty stuff mm -hmm. it's smothering the life um and a lot of it turns out to be clay and silt. That's why it has that mayonnaise feeling. And this is from work done by John Treffery up, up at Florida Institute of Technology. Um, he analyzed the muck and discovered uh, a large per percentage of it is clay, which I'm no geologist, but I, I've been told that clay doesn't belong here geologically. Um, and uh, Treffery seemed to indicate that it was probably coming from the landfill and the sod a lot of sod they put clay in it to be able to roll it out you know the um uh grass that they lay down like a carpet yep. um so all of that clay comes off and the silt and that ends up holding on to the nutrients and the pollutants um and so you know all of this stuff we've done to create our own little um front yard backyard heaven is really been messing with the lagoon a lot more than people realize. And I think it's, a, an, it's an education issue. If we could just make people more aware of how much of an impact that's having and that there are things that they can be doing that would make a difference. That's why you know we've been focusing so much on citizen science, like the project that Bridges um, here to talk about today with the, the fish, fishing to figure out you know, how these toxins are getting into our ecosystem and how they're getting into our fish. Yeah, let's let's talk about that. What so t what's your role? Like, what are you doing? How long you been doing it? And what what gets you excited on a day to day basis? Well, every day is a little different. I never know what I'm gonna gonna walk into when I come into the office. Um, but I currently oversee our One Health Fish Monitoring Project. It's one of five citizen science projects that we have here at Orca, and it really takes hold of this One Health philosophy, which is the idea that you and I. Um, are affected by the animals and the planet. And the actions that we have also affect them as well. And so we really do this um, through our Kilroys and our pollution mapping, we're able to identify different pollutants that are entering into the Indian River Lagoon. And using fishermen who are very helpful and willing to donate their fish, we're able to examine them for these potential pollutants. And then ultimately, we're able to look at and try and estimate the amount of exposure that we're being risk or being exposed to in these fish. Um, so that's really the goal of this project. Cool. Do you mind telling everyone what a Kilroy is? I, I'm willing to bet a lot of our anglers and, and boaters have seen them before. Uh, tell it, and we'll try to get a picture up there when we edit this. Tell tell us what it is and, and what it's doing. So it's a real time water quality monitoring system. Um, our goal in building the Kilroys was to create something less expensive and smaller so that they uh, could go up canals so that we could look at, you know, the major inputs to the lagoon. Um, they are uh, two thirds of the cost and half the size of comparable systems. Um, but you're still talking about $80,000 for one installation and thirty dollars to $35,000 a year 
in real costs for maintenance because you just put high tech equipment in seawater it takes lots of tender love and care we we have a very devoted team but they're always just struggling to keep those things healthy and, and clean and we appreciate the fishermen that that look out for them for us and, and you'll see them where where do you guys put them on channel markers and all yeah, kinds I, of it, existing channel markers and dock pilings we you know we have to get permits to put them out there so uh, it's a, there's a solar panel at the top um, there's a small box that is Kilroy's voice uh, that is basically cell phone technology so all of that real-time data is fed to our website if you go to tmarca.org and you click on the live feed all of that data is available for free to anyone anytime um, you can look at it in real time or you can plot the data over time um, and then uh, we have a sensor array underwater and then a larger box, which has a pump that pulls the water up into it to measure for nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and you know, it measures temperature, salinity, pH, dissolved oxygen, oxygen reduction potential, um, turbidity, I'm leaving pH, I'm, I'm leaving stuff out, I'm sure, but anyway, a lot of stuff. And, and these are all over the place. We have 18 now. We Dang. had as we had as many as 25 at one time, and then the funding funding got cut back. But it's gradually been being brought back. Um, as uh, so, most of that comes from the state, but some of it from individual counties. I, I, if I can interject, you know, I have experience with Hawk and YSI units for measuring all of these parameters individually. And just the portable units are thousands of dollars. So to, to implement 18 of these, it is, it is an investment. And to read it in real time, I mean, these diodes, they're sensitive. The maintenance, I'm sure, is, is very labor, labor intensive to go and check on that constantly. So that's incredible that that's accessible to us. And, and, I, and I would say, I don't, I don't think a lot of people realize kind of what goes into putting this kind of unit together to read all that information. Some of these things take, you know, several minutes and mixing and time and waiting to get general readings. But the fact that it's just going 24 seven for someone to know, it's really incredible. It's a very valuable resource. You knew all about the Kilroys, didn't you, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who's tried to keep their boat clean in the water knows about biofouling. Well, it just seems to be 10 times worse when you're talking about delicate electronic gear. <laughs> Can only yeah. imagine um talk, talk about living shorelines too that was another and you guys we'll put a link to 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 all the videos i, I love the little what is it called oh the the orca minute um and you guys had one where you talked about kilroys and one with living shorelines uh talk about some of the living shorelines you guys have done in the lagoon uh we we had a nice uh, project that was funded by impact 100 um where we uh partnered with the uh, um, Indian River Land Trust. Uh, so they had land that they had purchased to protect, but you know they had erosion problems in certain places. And so uh, we worked with um, uh, volunteers and high school students to create these living shorelines where they were replanted and then we're monitoring them um, so that we know how much of an impact that living shoreline actually has. You've been involved in some of the living shoreline projects, Bridget. You want to? And tell everyone, like, what is a living shoreline? Like, wh where would they see that? So a living shoreline is going to be kind of that interface between the water and your main dry land. Uh, really what constitutes a living shoreline is the fact that it's full of mangroves, your red, white, and black mangroves. We've got a lot of spartina grasses, which are really these tall, beautiful grasses that kind of flow in the wind. Um, they're really popular estuary and marsh grasses. And we also, what makes living shorelines different than buffered shorelines is our use of breakwaters. So our breakwaters in particular are made of a coquina shell, which is made of lime and kind of helps to combat acidification. Uh, so we really plan that out ahead of time to make sure that everything we are putting in the water was going to be best suited for our lagoon. Love it. Um... I don't think we ever really addressed it. Is is the ultimate goal with Orca to find out where the problem is and arrest everyone, or is it to like 
re reverse the damage and make it back like the good old days or like t tell us the the ultimate goal and, and kind of some of the findings too like what is what is your gut telling us that you guys are going to be able to do with all this well it's kind of incorporated our tagline which is mapping pollution finding solutions uh, we want to work with the community to find solutions that work for all of us um, you know it if if in if in one place you're finding that agriculture is a big part of the input, um, you can't get rid of agriculture. <laughs> you want to eat, right? Um, but but up in um, Chesapeake Bay, they started instituting um, forest buffer zones uh, along the edge of the ag community uh, uh, properties, and it it made a big difference in terms of the amount of runoff. So I mean. You know, there's different solutions for different parts of the community, um, but we need to figure out what those problems are and clearly define them for the public so they know where they should be putting their money in order to make them the biggest impact on the lagoon in the shortest period of time. And, and what's the, the prelim data saying so far? Do you guys have anything you guys can share? Well, the thing that's been most striking to me is the, this impact of stormwater runoff. Um, you know, all, all of the, the, everything that was done to make the water come off the land fast is part of what's impacting us. So I used to talk to people about the different species of nitrogen, you know, uh, oxidized versus reduced and, and different types of phosphate and different sources and eyes just glaze over, you lose them. They don't want to hear it. And, and, but it all really does come down to being carried into the lagoon by stormwater. And anything we do to slow down that flow allows nature to do a lot of the repair work for us and the cleanup for us. And so if we can just focus on that as the message that we wanna get out there, it would start having an impact. Clearly we wanna get rid of um, biosolids being spread near um, uh, waterfront property. Uh, we need more advanced wastewater treatment. Um, you know, there, there's a, a whole slew of things that we can be doing, but, but um, I think, you know, if in the category that most people are thinking in, something like living shorelines and buffered shorelines um, is something they can get behind. And, and what about like the, that muck? How, what breaks that down? How does that go away? It doesn't, unfortunately, you uh. end up having to dredge it, but that's what they're doing up in Brevard now. Um, and I recently had an interaction with one of the engineers up there because I had some concerns about, um, you know, a lot of dredging companies, they're just doing it to improve navigation. So they just do a channel down the center, but they're actually trying to do it up in Brevard to really make a difference for the environment. So they're doing a, a tapered type of dredging uh, which is kind of a new approach so that they can get more of that muck out um, because it's it is a huge source of the pollution and we're talking about decades worth that is yeah. has built up mm. justin i know you're dying to ask some questions <laughs> no i'm thinking about the muck i mean i <laughs> encounter it every time i take the kayak out and go fish any backwater section of north indian river lagoon or mosquito lagoon where there was otherwise tons of grass and now there is this this muck and i mean inherently some of it had been present underneath grass and i mean it, it had kind of always been there but it's not a natural means of filtration it, it traps you know these nutrients and organics that can't otherwise be removed so it just sits there and it's a vicious cycle of continuing to feed blooms i'm sure if there's ever a heavy storm or a lot of wind and shallow water that you get that turnover effect and all that sediment mixes and then we get a strong north wind and it just is a, a funnel down the river it's it's kind of you know there i don't know i really don't know how to stop it either but the dredging aspect is interesting i immediately think of the the dredging that's happening off the beach uh south of satellite beach but i don't think that's what you're referring to i think you're referring to parts of uh, north indian river as well right when they have to deepen the canals those are the kinds of dredge companies that come in and they're used to dealing with muck. Um, and so they, you know, it, it's a muck removal system, but you know, if you just do it down the center, which is what they would normally do for navigational purposes, it all, there's just all this up along the edge that slumps back down in. Um, but you know, everything you just said is exactly right. You, that muck is feeding 
the algae blooms. And that's why we're you know, turning into this algae dominated system with toxic algae, which is now getting into our food web in a variety of different ways. The most concerning is in the fish themselves because they're bioconcentrators. So, you know, little plankton eat the algae and then little fish eat the plankton and then bigger fish eat the little fish. And once you get up to the, the, the kind of fish that people want to eat, it's bioaccumulated to the point where it could be very unhealthy. And so that's what Bridget's uh, trying to do with this project is we're trying to determine which parts of the lagoon um, have the most toxic fish uh, and which species of fish are accumulating the most toxins. Well, I also think what's interesting to say, I mean, we talked about muck and the fact that it is silky and clay. And so it does have a lot of that turn up releasing a lot of pollutants that it was once holding, which can further expose our fish. And so really the goal of this project as well is to be able to give data about the state of our fish so people can make informed decisions about how they wanna proceed forward. So we're really looking at a number of different analyses, including microcystin, which is that toxic um, toxin from blue-green algae. We're looking at microplastics. We're looking at heavy metals. Um, we're also partnering with a number of different places like the University of Florida, uh, FIT, Florida Institute of Technology, and Barry College. Um, and we're able to look at Toxoplasma gondii, which is a parasite. Um, it's the same parasite that's found in kitty litter, which is why pregnant women aren't supposed to be cleaning kitty litter. Uh, we are looking at PFAS, which is per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, <laughs> or better said and shortened to forever chemicals. Gazoon so tight there, geez. That, yeah, that never dis disappear. They're in our environment forever. Um, and these are commonly found on like non stickware pans, uh, as well as in a lot of what I think they used to use a lot of firefighting equipment was made of this PFAS chemical. Um, and then we're also looking at pharmaceutical and controlled substances. So we're really making the most out of every fish that we get. We're trying not to let any part of the fish go to waste. Uh, and so we're constantly looking to expand what we can look at as well as who we're partnering with. Um, we want to get as much information as possible. And as many fish as possible. I'm, I'm yeah. hearing like all these things that, that essentially cause cancer. No big deal. Um, so Bridget and Dr. Edie, knowing what you know and seeing all the data that you get to see and all the toxins and would you eat if Justin and I went fishing today and gave you a fish and said, eat it out of the Indian River Glen, would you eat any of the fish? No, well, I'll know. say as, as myself, I don't eat fish. So uh, if, assuming you did. Of where it comes from, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think it depends. I think it's a personal decision. Um, I think it depends on the fish that you're getting. Uh, I think it depends on the flavor and how you're preparing the fish. Um, but I, I'd say it's up to you. I, I, I think it depends. It depends on a lot of different factors, including even season, keeping that in mind, what time of the year you're collecting your fish. Doctor? Uh, I'm with Bridget on, I, I try to aim towards a plant-based diet for the sake of the, uh, the, the planet. Um, yep. I do, I will confess I'm not as good at it as she is. I, I do revert to chicken every now and then, but I, got, I stopped eating fish a long time ago just because of my concerns about overfishing and the way certain things are fished. The, the one fish I eat every now and then is mahi mahi um, because of the, you know, they're caught um, individually on long lines and uh, they're very fast growing. They don't tend to have um, pollutant build up in them the way a lot of other fish do. One I can tell you, you should never ever eat is armored catfish. Armored and, catfish. Yeah, I, I, you would- They're here. You would, you would think nobody would eat them when you see them, but apparently they're a delicacy in some cultures. Are but, you talking uh, about a like brown hoplo? Yeah. Yeah. They're but they're not native. Way. They're they're an invasive species. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but there's <laughs> my goodness, they're survivalists. We I, I've been out there when we've had an uh you know dissolved oxygen plummet, and they're gulping air at the surface while all, all, everything else is going belly up. Um, but they seem to be well. I mean, they're bottom feeders, so it's not really that much of a surprise, but. I will go as far as saying you should probably not be eating those. 
Yeah, and the reason I, I I asked someone had forwarded over an article about that, um, and I don't remember who was behind it with the research. I have to go find it, but it was essentially alluding to the fact that you're you're flipping a coin when you're you know, keeping and harvesting and eating fish out of you know a lot of places in Florida, including Indian River Lagoon. So. Uh, yeah, well, anything wild caught, you just don't have any idea yeah. what it may have been exposed to. So you are, you're flipping a coin. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Justin, what else you got? Um, well, I'm not going to eat fish in the river, <laughs> but, but my reason is more so along the lines of what we're talking about and not so much, um, uh, what's the word for it? Like, I wouldn't say anthropomorphic, but like a subjective view on, well, the water looks poor. So therefore I'm going to think that the fish are not healthy. No, I mean, understanding that the water is indeed actually not healthy. And that, as you mentioned, Dr. Edie, it's bioaccumulation. They, they are vessels of whatever is happening in the lagoon system. So, you know, saying that you're taking a gamble on what you're eating, you know, out in the wild. Yes, that's true. We have no idea until we take a fish to Bridget and we get an you know, analysis of what is actually in these fish to determine whether this is safe and as intended or normal or, hey, there's something seriously wrong with this right now. Um, so no, I, I'm, I'm with you. I would not take that gamble as much as I like eating black drum once a year, once in a blue moon, maybe one time. I, sure, they may taste the same now as they did 10 years ago, but I would be much more apprehensive and I think it's important that the findings that that you can share with us and as fishermen would help people see things differently, because I think that the culture of fishermen uh, and their view of nature being the one to just fix everything naturally without any intervention is, you know, overlooking the fact that we have we have been a major player in this for the past 10 plus years or way longer. But in the past 10, we've seen a, a critical change of what's happening, at least in the Indian River system. And Joe, you mentioned everywhere. Um, so, you know, we should acknowledge that that it might be at a point where we would need to step back in and help repair and help this process, you know, to recover, to go back to the days of old that people love to say, but, um, you know, action, serious action needs to be taken to be able to get to that point. I mean, I will say too, like we, so part of our project is being able to go out and survey fishermen um, just to be able to understand how much they are consuming to better understand um, what we're facing. And we do have a number of citizen scientists that come in our lab and eat the fish from the Indian River Lagoon and they're, they're doing fine. Um, Still I think alive. Important, yeah. I think, <laughs> and have to keep in mind that, you know, our body has a lot of natural filtration itself to be able to protect us from anything that we may be consuming. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, I think we had talked about attaching the survey to this podcast as well. So hopefully people listening will go ahead and click on that and answer those questions for us. That'd be extremely helpful in our data collection. It kind of puts everything together. Cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll have that survey in the show notes at, uh, at saltstrong.com in a forward slash podcast, or if you're depending on where you're listening or watching on YouTube or wherever, it'll all be back at Salt Strong. We'll and YouTube will have the link uh, for that. Um, how else can we as anglers or, or any, anyone who's just interested in helping uh, volunteer? What, what are you guys looking for? Money, volunteers, all the above? I would say all of the above. Um, I'm going to specifically talk about this fish project, just given the nature of the fact that we're on a fishing podcast. Um, so the beauty about this project is the number of different ways that people can get involved. So as I mentioned, a big part of this is having fishermen donate their fish. Uh, and when they do that, we ask that it be legal uh, and incised and it be whole and frozen. Because as I mentioned, we like to make use of the entire fish. And then we're just making sure that each fish is being processed the same way. Um, and we do have a number of bait and tackle shops along the Indian River Lagoon that are currently acting as drop-off locations. So you can just walk in, tell them you have some fish from Orca, and we'll, they'll let us know and we can go pick them up. Um, the second way would be to come to one of our processing events. We have them here at our lab in Vero Beach. Um, we also are hosting events in Titusville, and we hope to have some down in Martin County here and soon in, in the future. Uh, and these processing events are pretty much dissection events. Uh, we're taking parts of the filet, we're taking the gills, we're taking the liver and the stomach uh, to be able to analyze everything we need. 
Um, and then the last part would be further lab analyses. So in order to look at some of these uh, pollutants I talked about, there's just some extra lab work that needs to be done. So citizen scientists can get involved in a number of ways for this project in particular. And there's more information on our website uh, under citizen science fish monitoring. And it's teamorca.org, right? Yes. Yep. Do, do you guys have any place where the public can see some of this pollution mapping? Is, is that available as well? Like uh, on actual like map overlays? Yeah, it's on our website. Okay. Every, cool. every pollution map we've ever done is on, uh, is on our website. And we, you know, eventually hope to have the whole lagoon map, but we have to raise funding for any of these projects. So cool. Uh, Dr. Edie, if you don't mind, I know off, uh, offline, we talked about offshore trawling and, and, and that could probably be its own separate podcast, but do you mind kind of giving a teaser? Cause the, this is, it's pertinent and it's, it's happening now. And I, I'm willing to bet a lot of anglers are not even aware of it. Can you give the 30,000 foot view of, of what happened and then now what's, you know, being pr proposed? Yeah, so back in the 1970s, uh, scientists from Harbor Branch were surveying off the coast here for the first time and discovered this ivory tree coral called Oculina um, and uh, mapped it all up along the length past Cape Canaveral. Um, and at, at that time, at, uh, soon after it was documented, um, they created a small portion of it that was a marine protected area. The rest of it was not protected. Um, and then when they went back some years later, all of the rest of it was gone. It was rubble. It had just been turned to nothing. And that uh, the original protected area, there was still standing coral. Well, this was a major, major portion of the fin fish uh, fishery, the, the uh, snapper grouper, uh, where there were just hundreds of them because they would come, they'd come out of the lagoon and, and spawn on those coral heads. And um, the incredible thing is that having seen the decimation caused by this bottom trawling, which was just for rock shrimp, so a very small fishery compared yeah. to the fin fish fishery, um, decimating this habitat for the fin fish fishery. Uh, and now they've just passed the, the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council just passed Amendment 10, which is going to open up a portion of that um, area for trawling again. And there was a, some evidence of the uh, coral larvae coming, you know, and settling on the rubble and starting to grow. It grows very, very slowly. It was going to take a very long time, but at least there was some hope of recovery. Well, now there will be none. So they passed Amendment 10 and the thing that's crazy about this is that one, uh, one or more members of the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, which is supposedly there to protect the coral reef, are rock shrimp fish fishers. So this is the fox wa watching the hen house. And I, I think yeah. the fin fish fishery should be getting a say in this because the, you know snapper and grouper are a big deal and to have wiped out their nursery and then want to keep wiping it out even further makes no sense at a time when you know everybody's talking about we need more protected areas. Yeah, I mean, I think any average human can look at that and say something is wrong. Uh, like follow the the vote to the money trail of that's nuts. I mean, that's absolutely nuts. It's absolutely uh, nuts. And the thing the thing is that this um, is a a case study that that needs to be publicized because so often this has happened in, in all of these undersea gardens that have just been decimated for with bottom trawling and but nobody ever sees it so it's out of sight and out of mind yeah. but because of the work that john reed at harbor branch did in the early days we have the original video of what this looked like and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of snapper and grouper enormous fish swimming around these coral heads and now it looks like a moonscape. So, you know, just that imagery alone should be an, a gut punch for anybody that cares anything about our fisheries. Mm. Well, thank you. Mm. I, I think we'll have to do a follow up on that. Um, what, so has this Amendment 10 or whatever, has, is this a done deal? Are they going to start trawling again or is there a it, chance it, to? It, yeah, the, it's, it, it was passed by the, the, the council. And so now it's gone back to, to NOAA. Um, 
to, um, her name is Coit. She's going to be the final word. Janet Coit, C-O-I-T, um, is going to be the final say, apparently. Uh, and it, it's, it looks like it might actually happen, which I, I just, I'm gobsmacked. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get her email and we'll all start blowing her up. <laughs> uh, that's crazy. Um, yeah. She's head of NOAA fisheries. I think what's crazy is that we don't know this as fishermen. Like it is not well, it's not publicized. Like it's, it's just not out there as common knowledge, yeah. you know? So that's, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm without words too. Cool. Uh, Bridget, uh, any, any specific fish you, you mentioned that uh, you guys are taking fish, any specific species you guys need? I'm so glad you said that because I realized I did not include that. So when it comes to fish, we specifically want fish from the Indian River Lagoon or adjacent waterways. So Lake Okeechobee, Lake Washington, the Thick Marsh, um, any of those contributing water bodies. Uh, we're particularly interested in fish that people are most likely to eat. So black drum, red drum, sheephead, um, there's more I could name. But we'll take anything. We've looked at catfish. We've even started to do some mullet, um, being able to analyze some bait fish as well. Uh, so we'll take anything, but we're really trying to focus in on the particular fish that people are most likely to consume in the first place. Justin's really good at catching puffer fish and lizard fish. So maybe we'll send you a whole crate of. I would be happy to do it. <laughs> we just got a southern puffer fish the other day, actually. Nice. <laughs> Someone will eat it. Oh, golly. Too funny. Um, all right. So everyone could go to teamorca.org, right? Yeah. And and then do you, in, in case they're there, do you have the same survey link there somewhere on the site? We should, and we should have it on our Facebook page as well. Okay, cool. So we're trying to get as much feedback as we can, because like I said, it kind of puts the whole picture together. Is anything else that we can be doing to rally the troops and uh besides sharing this episode yeah. with uh with everyone and and just getting more awareness anything else any like big events coming up in particular so we've got a few specifically for this fish processing event so next week um on the third we will actually be having a processing and intro event here in our vero lab and then march 30th i believe uh, at 6 p.m., we are going to have an update about this project, and that's open to anyone who might be interested in all of those different variables I previously talked about. Um, it'll just kind of show you up to this point what we've seen, because we have, we've done about over 600 fish at this point, so we've got a good bit of data, um, but again, we're, this is over two years, so we're hoping to be able to keep going and collect more fish, uh, but March 30th will be that update about this project. Cool. Awesome. We'll put a link to that as well. Uh, both of you guys, thank you so much. And I know you have a, a massive, you know, group of, of team and volunteers and a lot of people behind this. So thanks to everyone who's, you know, I mean, you guys are going there around the clock. It looks like full time and putting a lot of money and resources into saving the lagoon and, uh, and, and hopefully bringing it back. I don't know if it'll be back to the way it, it was, uh, you know, in the 1930s, but uh, just stopping this, I mean, what we would say, I mean, it looks, it seems like every year, right, Justin, you know, our, our club keeps growing and every year people are like, man, the lagoon just keeps getting worse and worse. At least just stopping it and we're slowly reversing it back would be massive, massive win. So uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. All right, everyone check out their site, teamorca.org. And we will have all the links to everything we talked about, including the survey and all the fish studies and, uh, and uh, the, all that will be at saltshore.com. You can go up to the top under the fishing tip section, or you can go to saltshore.com forward slash podcast. And uh, you'll see that episode right there at the top. And at the bottom of the actual blog post slash link, there's an area where you can post a question and it'll come to me or Justin directly. And then we could forward it on if you have anything specific to, that we missed or uh or that we just somehow forgot to talk about, but we covered a lot. I got some cool, uh, cool notes here and uh, let's get rid of that black mayonnaise on the bottom as fast as we can. That is so gross. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.